Well, welcome everyone that's uh, joining us, whether it's uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where you're logging in. My name is Matthew Schmitz in San Antonio, Texas, and on behalf of the International Orthopedic Diversity Alliance, I want to welcome you to this webinar on diversity in orthopedic publishing and, and a path towards excellence. Uh, we as members of IOTA thought it would be great to put together a panel of leaders in the field from orthopedic publishing and, and speak on diversity topics, and I'm really honored that we've got some good friends and, and guests with us here today. Um, the order that we'll go in is uh, Dr. Mark Swinkowski, who's the editor-in-chief of the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, is going to lead us off, followed by uh, Dr. Kanu Okiki, who is the deputy editor for health disparities for JBJS, uh, and then followed up by uh, Dr. Lori Heimstra, past president of Canadian Orthopedic Association. Uh, and so again, we're really excited that folks have joined us today. And with that, I'll turn the screen over uh, to Dr. Swinkowski. Thank you, Matt. Let me see if I can perform the share of screen maneuver. Can you see that editorial? Yes, sir, we can. Okay. Now I just have to figure out how to get to the control buttons. Oh. Stop sharing. You told me we should have practiced this, Matt. You are absolutely right. Okay. Okay, now where is the button to? I think this is it. No. Sorry about this, uh, folks. I am unable to find the controls for, let's see this one. Okay, where's the forward and back? Very embarrassing here. Well, we're gonna, we're just gonna fly with this, uh, without any fancy PowerPoints, because the value of these sorts of endeavors is definitely in the in the discussion part. So uh, as Matt mentioned, I am the de uh, the editor in chief of the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, which is in now it's 140th year, uh, the oldest uh, publication in the field, uh, founded by the American Orthopedic Association way back in the 1800s. And uh, it has been a real honor. Um, and heading into my tenth year now, uh, and we'll be handing off the baton uh, shortly. But uh, the topic, really, for me to address is um, how can a scholarly publication uh, be involved uh, in this very important activity? And I would uh, choose just uh, two words. Uh, one is follow the evidence. Uh, we are a scientific publication, so it seems reasonable that we should follow the scientific evidence. And then second is intentionality. So when I say follow the evidence, uh, there are, I think most of the audience is going to be aware, overwhelming evidence that uh, patients do best when the people caring for them uh, represent their uh, individual background, experience, uh, ethnicity, et cetera. Uh, and it's very evident based on the evidence that uh, it does make a difference uh, that uh, individuals uh, have somebody caring for them that, that look like them, that are uh, able to relate to them with common experiences, uh, et cetera, and that the health outcomes are improved when that is the case. So um, I have uh, been aware of the uh, issues um, with health disparities that are primarily related to the social determinants of health, uh, and perhaps uh, Dr. Okiki will get into that, but that um, uh, this is a very important uh, area of research, and it's been shown over and over again in joint replacement and trauma, et cetera. Uh, so there's solid evidence to suggest that the social determinants of health not only impact who's caring for the patient, uh, but also the quality of care, uh, and the access to resources so that outcomes can be optimized. So it's clear that the evidence states 
that we in a scholarly publication should be supporting all efforts to diversify the group of individuals caring for patients with musculoskeletal disease and injury. So that's uh, uh, point one. So point two is uh, intentionality. And uh, the journal uh, started down this road of intentionality in terms of how we select uh, editorial board members, uh, et cetera. Uh, I wanna say seven to eight years ago, um, I want to give Matt and the other founders of IOTA a lot of credit for assembling this organization to get the word out worldwide. I think it has made a difference and will uh, continue to make a difference going forward. But when I was uh, contacted and asked to sign on to the, uh, the position statement, I was a little bit hesitant because I didn't want to call attention to the activities of JBGS. Uh, because we're just doing the right thing. I don't need anybody to give us uh, accolade or anything like that. That's that, There's no need for that. It's just doing the right thing to diversify uh, our, our reviewer panels, our editorial board members across all six journals, et cetera. So we've been very intentional about that. Um, uh, and have I had another slide of, a, of an editorial that uh, Dr. Okiki led which established our policy on DEI at JBJS. Uh, and we're going to be conducting the next step at our meeting in September, where we uh, begin to uh, document uh, our efforts in this area by having first our editorial board fill out survey uh, as to their background, ethnicity, et cetera, uh, as well as our employees at JBJS. Uh, and we have a DEI committee at the journal we have uh, 38 employees at the journal. We have a DEI committee there. And I did a, a temporary tally uh, based on imperfect knowledge of the 36 members of our editorial board at the current time of the flagship, the oldest journal in the portfolio. And right now we have uh, five women of the 36 and five individuals from underrepresented minorities. That's not enough. It's not. Uh, completely balanced as it should be, but we're moving in the right direction. So my comments really are, again, to remind the audience of those two words, following the evidence about how important this is for our patients uh, and for the progress of our field, and then being intentional about doing the right thing. So Matt, I'm going to stop there and please accept my apologies for not being able to advance the slides, but I'm, I'm not a big PowerPoint lover anyway, so <laughs> no, no harm from my view. No problem, Mark. Thank thank you for that. And, and I think we'll we'll maybe take a couple of minutes for questions now. And again, for anyone that's participating at home or at work, please feel free to use the Q&A uh, or the chat function to type in questions. But Mark, my, one of my questions for you is, what do you think are some of the barriers to publishing uh, right now a paper that that focuses on on EDI topics is it is it the, the lack of scientific rigor or um, you know I know that the journal JBS has been very intentional about incorporating some of those types of articles. But what do you what do you what as as a, a potential author out there what do you foresee would be the biggest barrier in your opinion in 2023? Well, it's a great question, Matt, and I want to assure the audience that that was not pre-programmed, but uh, this is uh, Dr. Okiki's editorial, uh, as you can see, published uh, two years ago. Uh, the barrier basically is lack of, of data on solution. I think we have plenty of data on the problem, but what we're seeking is uh, individuals and groups that really approach the issue in a way that can lead the nation and the world uh, on how to address this. Um, uh, so I guess you could say it's scientific rigor, but it really is uh, prospectively collected data on solutions on how to how to deal with these uh, disparities. That That's what we want. We have a lot of articles pointing out the problems, which are very real, and those findings are reproducible. But, boy, we, we want some solutions. Yeah, no, I agree. And I think it'll be, you know, we'll save some time at the end where we can kind of uh, go through different different uh, scenarios and questions for the entire group. But thank you for that, Mark. And that I, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Kanu Okiki, who's from um, uh, Kaiser in Honolulu, again, the deputy editor for JBJS for uh, health disparities uh, for the next presentation. So Dr. Okiki. Thanks very much for that introduction. 
Uh, Mark, I think you might need to stop uh, screen sharing so I can share mine. You got it. I think I can do that. I'm clearly incompetent in the other area, but <laughs> there you go. Mm. All right, let me grab it here. Hang on. Mm. All right, well, thanks again for that introduction. Um, as was mentioned earlier, um, I'm an orthopedic trauma surgeon out here in Honolulu and also currently serve as deputy editor for health disparities at JBJS. Um, our webinar uh, today focuses on uh, diversity in uh, publishing, um, but I did want to spend a minute talking about um, disparities, uh, given that it is a, a related topic. Um, I think as Mark alluded to, at this point, we have uh, many, many studies in the orthopedic literature documenting uh, disparities in essentially all subfields of orthopedics. Um, and I think it's important to acknowledge that um, the these disparities, these inferior outcomes that certain members of uh, the US population experience are not due to uh, biologic reasons or um, the color of their skin, um, they are mediated by uh, social factors, um, social determinants of health. And I think we are now starting to see studies that are a bit more, let's say, careful or sophisticated in their analysis, um, you know, specifically controlling for some of these factors and starting to get at uh, the factors that are actually mediating uh, these differences. Um, and I think that's one thing um, that, you know, we we do like to see um, from a, a publishing perspective, uh, studies that are a bit more um, sophisticated. Um, as Mark also alluded to, I think at this point we have a plethora um, of studies that are documenting uh, disparities. Um, and while that is very, very important and continues to be important, um, I think we are at the stage where um, starting to identify solutions um, to these problems um, is probably what's needed most. Um, you know, taking analogies from from clinical orthopedics, um, it's not enough to document the patients who may be at higher risk of, you know, dislocation after hip replacement. Um, there's been a lot of research and um, uh, on interventions to, to how do we prevent that, um, including technological advancements, you know, dual mobility. And I think uh, we as practitioners and uh, those of us um, in the publishing world are would encourage researchers to not stop at documenting differences, um, but to think of and try out um, interventions that could um, that could help ameliorate some of these differences. If there are groups that uh, we know uh, do worse, um, what are what are some ways that uh, they can be targeted, perhaps for extra attention? to prevent the missed appointments that are more common in one group or another or the inferior outcomes. Um, as Mark suggested, uh, I do think that disparities and diversity are linked. Um, for example, studies in other fields, um, less so orthopedics, um, uh, we've seen that uh, physicians who are of a racial and ethnic minority are much more likely to work in an underserved area. Um, and similarly, um, there's been evidence of uh, patient provider concordance being beneficial. So um, again, not in orthopedics, but in other fields, if a patient um, has a primary care physician, for example, that looks like them, uh, they're more likely to rate those visits higher, to adhere to medications. Um, and so I, I do think there is uh, a value in uh, diversity, specifically um, as we try to reduce disparities in our field. Uh, but the topic uh, today is diversity in orthopedic publishing. 
Um, so from my standpoint, um, I think that, uh, again, so I just brought up the example of disparities in orthopedics. I think uh, for many years, disparities were largely unknown, uh, aside from those who experienced them daily. And uh, these days, it, uh, they're, they're very well known in the literature. Um, but I think uh, with regard to diversity in publishing, we, we are still in that kind of data-free era where I think there's actually very, very little data specifically with regard to racial and ethnic uh, disparities, sorry, racial and ethnic diversity uh, in orthopedic publishing. Um, and so I would think about it uh, in terms of three broad categories. So author diversity, um, it can be difficult to survey authors at the time of manuscript submission as to their race or ethnicity due to concerns, uh, whether valid or not, uh, about discrimination in the review process, um, even in a situation like JBJS where there is blinded review. Um, reviewers often try to uh, remain anonymous. Um, and again, there's blinded review that also interferes with uh, documenting and, and publishing the, the diversity of reviewers. And at the editor level, um, uh, Mark mentioned that at JBGS, we're embarking on a survey um, of our editorial boards to, 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 to try to start to get at um, what is the diversity at JBGS. But in general, uh, very few journals um, record this information internally, and even fewer um, spread it or, or report it publicly. Um, and so I would suspect that uh, the representation of racial and ethnic minorities in all of these categories, authors, reviewers, and editors, would be low, um, and, and that we do need to improve. Um, but in the absence of any documentation of this, uh, I think we're in the dark. So uh, I think the first step is is trying to find ways to um, document uh, where we are right now. Um, and in that documentation, I think it's not just not just uh, diversity, uh, so not just numbers, but also um, you know we think about inclusion. What has been the experience of uh, authors uh, who, who come from uh, minority groups, um, reviewers and editors, do they feel included uh, in the in the review process and the editorial board um, happening? So, so not just numbers, but also the experience of those who are in those positions. So um, I agree. I think the biggest value of a forum like this is in the questions, in the discussion. Uh, so I'll stop there and look forward to uh, discussion. Thank you, Kavu. Can you, one question I had for you is, is that in your role as deputy editor for health disparities, two, a two-part question, are you aware of many other journals that have a similar role? And, and, and what, if you were, if you were to walk up to someone on the street and explain what you consider your role to be with, within the journal or in the medical publishing, how, how do you explain that to someone? What, what is your day-to-day -day role with the journal? Yeah, good question. Um, so the short answer is I am not familiar with too many um, journals who have uh, taken the step to specifically um, appoint or assign a deputy editor specifically dedicated to this topic. Um, I think that many journals uh, believe it's important. Um, and I think there are many different ways to, um, to get at this. Um, and by this, I mean ensuring that studies that are on this topic are evaluated uh, fairly um, and rigorously um, by, by someone who has expertise in the field, let's say. Um, and there are many different ways to do that. Um, but in terms of, uh, you know, my role, um, you know, and I have to thank Mark for this, um, it's one that, uh, you know, where all of the deputy editors um, participate not only in the, the areas that we specialize in, um, but the overall, um, you know, uh, 
review of articles, whether they be related to this topic or not, um, you know, uh, guidance uh, for where the journal's going. Um, and yeah, that's important uh, for the for the inclusion part that I mentioned earlier. Um, that you know you're you're not just here for your for your thoughts on 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 diversity or disparities. Yeah, that's great. And we've got a live question, and I'll and I'll pose this to both Mark and uh, and Kanu. Is is you know when we when we think about residency and, and the the process of publishing, you go from author and then maybe you become a reviewer and eventually move up the chain and, and potentially become a deputy editor. So one of the questions that came out from from the one of the participants is. How is JBGS, how is the team working to incorporate research surgeons from low income countries to, to be members of to be members as reviewers or potentially editors as well? Mark, you want to take that one? Sure. Yeah. So we have had um, uh, a, a call for reviewers from uh, developing world countries on a couple of occasions in my nine and a half years as editor. Um, and we are always open uh, to having anybody send me a CV. And as long as there is demonstrated some experience uh, with clinical and or basic science research, uh, we're happy to in include them uh, in the reviewer panel. We are, to my knowledge, the only journal that has a problem with too many reviewers. Um, that is a very unique problem in our field and any other field. So we do have uh, ways that we call reviewers that do a poor job. Every, every review is graded. Uh, we also monitor how long it takes to respond. Uh, and if a reviewer refuses three in a row, that's three strikes you're out. Um, so, but we have intentionally uh, tried to increase the panel of international reviewers outside of North America, US and Canada. And at the current time, the percentage of our reviewer panel of around a thousand reviewers, it's right around 19% are outside of North America. Uh, but it's that's up from the low single digits uh, nine years ago. That's that's great. One of the other questions was, is how does JBGS facilitate publication from scholars from resource limited setup, and you mentioned a little bit in your talk about blinded review process, et cetera. Anything else that you'd add on that on that topic? Well, um, I'll 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 take that one as well, and and Kano can uh, chime in if if he has uh, thoughts on it. Um, that's one of the uh, I guess the uh, the the privileges of being the editor is um, there are ways that uh, one can uh, slant the review process, maybe that's not the right word, but um, balance the review process to favor uh, individuals uh, from developing countries in publishing in the journal. Uh, and I'm, I'm pleased to report that we have published, you know, manuscripts from Ethiopia and the Philippines and uh, Mexico, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in, when you're assigning reviewers, which oftentimes for those uh, types of submissions, I will tend to have reviewers who have experience in developing world orthopedics, and both in education and research, reviewing those manuscripts because they have a broader review, or pardon me, a broader view of the difficulties with doing uh, research in those environments that you know the resources aren't the same. The difficulties with follow-up aren't the same uh, and tend to review manuscripts in a more favorable light. It's still double blind, but as editor, you know, again, I can slant the review process in a more favorable direction. And that's what I've done. And I will continue to do that. And I hope my successor would continue to do that as well. No, that that's great. And then we've got some more questions. And I, I figured we would save time at the at the very end where everyone can kind of chime in on questions. So, so with that, I'd like to turn it over to Lori Heimstra, who again I mentioned is the past president of the Canadian Orthopedic Association. Uh, she has a, a significant history with publishing articles related to DEI topics. And so with that, I'll turn it over to you, Lori. Awesome. 
Thanks, Matt. Uh, thank you, everyone. It's uh, actually quite an honor to be here with you today, because by no means do I consider myself an expert in publishing, but I always have an opinion. So I do have some thoughts to share with you and uh, look forward to the discussion afterwards. There we go. So just in preparation of, for this, what I tried to do is look at how many articles are actually published about diversity in orthopedics? And it's actually a bit of a difficult PubMed search to do, but I did my best last night. And first I thought I'll look up some common things in orthopedics. So I, I, I threw in spondylolisthesis into PubMed and I got close to 8,000 uh, hits. And I threw in ACL reconstruction, clearly a very interesting topic. And you almost got close to 20,000 hits. Threw in arthroplasty, obviously. And then I put in uh, increasing diversity in orthopedics, and I had to fiddle with the words a little bit, but a grand total of 100 papers come up. So there's lots of opinion pieces, and there, there might be lots of editorials these days, but when you actually look at sort of review slash scientific articles, there's actually not a lot in the literature about increasing diversity in orthopedics. Um, so I think uh, well taken points previously, we need to publish about this, but we need to figure out why it's difficult to publish in diversity topics and also take a really close look at what we're publishing and why. So frame of reference. So looking at some of the barriers to publishing things about diversity and my background has been largely gender diversity for some obvious reasons, but I think all the principles uh, that we find in diversity hold for the other underrepresented groups, at least to a, a great point. So when you look at what were some of the barriers we've seen to publishing in uh, this realm is despite the fact that a lot of diversity has to do with sex, diversity is really not actually a very sexy subject. So again, it's, uh, it, it doesn't, people don't get all excited when they see an article on diversity. It, it's not super exciting, like the, you know, how we're gonna fix femur fractures and they'll heal in two weeks. So um, we need to make the subject so important that it, it needs to be more exciting. But I think the reason it's not an exciting project uh, subject is a lot that people, when they read an article about diversity, the news tends to be not great, right? And the articles these days are not, we are doing so awesome, we're fighting the fight and you know we're becoming more equitable or you know everything's getting better. It tends to be pointing out what are what the problems are. And so many people don't like what the mirror reflects back at us. So when we read these articles, they're actually, sometimes you read them, they're, they're a bit of a downer. So again, so important to understand what our world is like and how people are experiencing the world, but there certainly aren't happy articles. And so there tends to be a lot of denial also. So again, if you um, are reading an article about diversity in orthopedics and you feel that you were a victim of that, it actually can be very difficult. I know I've read articles and you're like, well, you know, those things happened to me. Like, why the heck didn't I stand up for myself? Why was, why did I not do something about it 20 years ago when I was a resident and this happened to me? So it can be hard on people who have been victims. If you have um, perhaps been a part of a discriminatory environment, either consciously or not con subconsciously, there might be some feelings of guilt. And even if you've been in that environment and been a bystander and not necessarily an upstander, it can be very difficult for, for people to read these topics. So I think some of the other barriers there are to publishing in orthopedics is that there is variability in experience. And when you are a author, or if you are a reader, or if you are an editor or a reviewer, you need to understand that people have experienced our orthopedic world in different ways. We found this in our paper about barriers for women in Canadian orthopedics. We had uh, many women answer, you know, I had no problem. I didn't feel I was discriminated against at all. I was treated very well. And then we had other women with horrible stories of discrimination. So really understanding that when you read, especially when you read the more qualitative side of things that people have had different experiences and you really need to be able to put yourself in someone else's shoes and if what you are reading about is not necessarily your experience, it doesn't mean that people aren't experiencing that out there. And a lot of the reasons behind these issues and disparities we're having in orthopedics has to do with our patriarchal society. 
So I almost couldn't put that word in because I just watched the Barbie movie yesterday and all the controversy that swung up. But the reality is, is we do live in a world that was made by men and for men. And so from a gender perspective, um, there, is, there, uh, it, there are difficulties um, if you are a woman in orthopedics. And we also live in a world that is fairly white dominant. So if you are not white, there are difficulties. We live in a world that's fairly heterosexual. And so if you're not heterosexual, there are difficulties. So um, these, uh, the way our society is made has catered to these majorities and that makes it hard for the minor minorities. And that leads to this unconscious bias. And I think really understanding, especially if you are a reader, if you are a reviewer, understanding those unconscious biases that you may not always uh, understand everything was written, but you may must make room for people to have felt that way. That's kind of my qualitative um, background of some of the barriers that exist, because when you're writing articles in the diversity space, you need to keep these in mind. And part of what I think of being uh, as an under, unrepre underrepresented group, I just saw this little quote, and I know it's a quote that I'll read to you, but but being a woman and you can um, you can put in there any kind of underrepresented group, is kind of like being a cyclist in a city full of cars and where the cars represent men or whatever my majority you're talking about. You're supposed to be able to share the road equally, but that's not how it works. The road is made for cars and you spend a great deal of physical and mental energy being defensive and trying not to get hurt. Some of the cars want you to get hurt. They think you don't have any place on the road at all. And if you do manage to get hurt, everyone makes excuses that it's your fault. So it's a bit of a metaphor, but it makes helps you understand how it feels to be part of an underrepresented group and maybe gives you some perspective on uh, some of the content of what we're trying to publish in the diversity space. So more practical tips. I just wanted to give that background because I think it's really important how you approach these. Now, if you're an author, you see what all these barriers are. You're like, what the heck? Why would I ever want to publish anything if that's what I'm fighting against? But I think there's some real tips to make um, your, your publications and your papers much more easy for people to digest and understand and really not get people's hackles up about it. I'll go through some of them. This is by no means a uh, totally inclusive list, but know your language. I think there's nothing worse than if you are reading a paper about diversity and um, something says some, somebody uh, says something or uses a word in the wrong way. So there is a difference between equality and equity, and those should be used properly. The word minority is also a difficult one. I know we've used it for many, many years in the past, and sometimes it's true, but it actually has a bit of a pejorative connotation. So again, just because you uh, are less than maybe the majority might not mean you're discriminated against, but it's more that you're an underrepresented group. So there are less of you than there are the other group. It may not mean anything bad and it might mean something bad. So I think the word minority with its negative connotation, we should try to avoid and talk more about marginalized groups or underrepresented groups. This is my, uh, my one that gets my goat is the female versus woman. So female is an adjective. I am, don't like to be referred to as a female. Um, if any of you watch Star Trek, it's, it reminds me of the Ferengis on Star Trek, but uh, I, I am a woman. I am a female surgeon. I'm a female golfer, but I am a woman. So I think using female and woman properly with the, as an adjective and a noun is really important because if you're reading, if you're reading these things and you're already not liking what you're reading so much, these little things can make a difference. And of course, with all underrepresented groups, we want to use person first language. So um, I am a person with a mental health disorder. I'm not crazy. I am not a paraplegic. I'm a person who uh, has a wheelchair or needs a wheelchair. So using those person center words, so we're not um, calling, our, calling people by their disease or condition. Keep the chip off your shoulders. So again, if you've had very bad experiences and you're publishing in the diversity space, it can be very easy to be a bit bitter about that. And I think it's very important in the publishing realm, and this probably shouldn't get by the reviewers um, or the editors, but you don't want to sound like there's a big chip on your shoulder. We are scientists and we publish scientific things, even though if the diversity space isn't quite as scientific as some of the other medical things we publish. We want to keep that chip off our shoulder and really uh, report the whole story. 
So uh, what I mean by report the whole story is, again, if I'm going to do a survey of medical students asking about, say, barriers, if I'm uh, interviewing both male and female um, medical students, don't just report what the, what, the, what the women said. We have to report both sides of the story. So the question you ask always has to be more important than the answer. And so when we do surveys, when we do things where we're gathering data, we want to make sure we present a, um, a fair story of both sides and not try to tell the story that we want to tell, the story that maybe we know is out there, but we, we're still scientists and we want to report the whole story. And that's where we want to use this science. And again, Mark said, follow the evidence. Um, much of diversity work is about stories and stories are very, very important, but we also need to use good evidence. I'm Canadian, so I grew up, grew up with the Sandy Kirkley and the Mohit Bandari era and we like our evidence. So there are um, validated and reliable outcome measures that you can use. So injecting a little bit more science into our data beyond the stories is really important. And it's also important for following. So uh, we talked about uh, needing solutions and not just documenting the problem. Well, unless we have validated outcomes or data to measure how we're improving over time, um, we're not doing good science. So we really want to be able to uh, be more scientific about what we're reporting. And then finally, as uh, a reviewer, as a reader, just keep an open mind for all the reasons we just discussed. Uh, remember that not everybody's experience might be the same as yours. We really need to understand what privilege we bring into the room uh, and, and what we don't have to think about. And I always love this quote, like privilege is when you're always given the benefit of the doubt. So if you're that person walking in the room and you never get the benefit of the doubt, that's that's an underrepresented uh, discrimination problem. But when you have privilege, you get the benefit of the doubt. And we need to check that at the door. So that is what I have about my experience being an author. And I'm happy to talk about anything or answer any questions. Thank you, Lori. That was fantastic. And, and I've, we've got a couple of questions from the audience that I would like to kind of pose to the panel. Uh, the first comes in from Christy Weber, who, who says that she reviews a reasonable number of articles related to DEI that are survey based uh, and can sometimes be heavily opinion based. Uh, and so can can each of you maybe opine a bit from your perspective about the ideal article format and research focus that is more likely to be published, i.e. how do you get robust data on the topic of diversity, equity, inclusion? Laura, you want to start? <laughs> yeah, that's a bit what I was talking about. And um, it's really difficult because, you know, any of you have tried to create validated outcome measures. It is a whole bunch of work, uh, especially with for something a little more. Um, uh, it's not so binary, right? It's not, it's very qualitative, things like barriers and discrimination. So, you know, there are a few outcome measures coming out there, but I think, you know, I, I think about this a lot and I, I actually think we need to try to find a way to look at these things from a different perspective, maybe take off our orthopedic hats and find an, a, a, a different, unique way to to look at outcomes that, that are validated. And I don't know what that is, Christy. I, I, We'll probably discuss it at some point, but it, we've tried very hard to to inject that science in there, and it's very difficult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you, Connor. You kind of touched on it. You said, you know, there's been a lot of articles that describe the disparities, but maybe you know the next step would be how do you overcome those disparities, and then and then looking at outcomes. Maybe expand on that a little bit. Yeah. Um... So that's so it's challenging, right? If if I had the answers, I would do it myself. Um, but um, I think there are examples in other fields of things that have been done to um, almost give preferential treatment to those who are at risk of inferior outcomes, right? So. Um, you know, one of my earliest mentors outside orthopedics, um, Dr. Paul Farmer, um, who, um, you know, recently passed away, um, but um, his organization, Partners in Health, uh, operated um, clinics in a variety of countries. Um, you know, I volunteered for them in Peru, but their mantra was giving a preferential option to the poor. 
in that if you just treat folks who don't have transportation or finances or all the other things that allow everyone else to access healthcare, if you just treat them all the same, um, you you know what the outcomes are going to be. One group's going to do poorly and another group might do okay. Um, and, uh, you know, his approach was always, okay, let's identify the barriers and let's figure out ways to overcome them. And not surprisingly, uh, the medicines work as well in poor patients as they do in rich patients. Um, you just need to help them with transportation, directly observe therapy, et cetera. So the, the, the principle there is um, let's not let uh, these social factors, which we know to be barriers, um, impede, impede treatment. And it's a completely different way of approaching healthcare. Um, and so I think about things like that. And, and then I think about you know, my practice, the practice of orthopedics um, in, in the United States. And I wonder, okay, what are the ways that we could take that philosophy um, to our patients um, that we know are are going to do are going to fare worse? Um, and I think uh, I think there are ways to start um, identifying programs and interventions to um, target uh, patients at risk of disparities. Um, and those those are the the ideas, the interventions, the research um, that we'd really like to see um, in the uh, in the disparities realm. Um, there are a number of great questions in the chat. Um, I, I assume you're going to get to them. Yeah, that's what, that's what I. That, my next one is um, Stuart Proper said that you know lack of diversity and discrimination are subtly different. Where di lack of diversity is an act of omission, where discrimination is an active act. <laughs> Um, you know, so where do the lack of studies, including minority groups or performance of research by more minority groups and publishing of research by minority groups lie in this spectrum? Mark, what do you think with your with the editor in chief hat on? Where do you do you think it's a mixture of um, active omission or, or and also an active act of discrimination? Hopefully, hopefully not. But what are your thoughts on just the, the general topic of of discrimination versus lack of diversity as it comes to to orthopedic publishing well i don't have any real data uh on the 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 prevalence if you will of discrimination on the part of reviewers uh it would be interesting to have such data but it, it's a it's a generally a, a perspective that people are hesitant to admit even if they do hold those types of perspectives um my my sense is that that's that's not hugely prevalent uh i have no idea you know any sort of numeric value to it yeah but it it, it is a it's a a perspective that um does not uh, account for the difficulty in doing research in different environments uh, with different populations that uh, Kano was alluding to with his prior comment uh, that that is something that people who are in positions like mine have to, if we're going to move forward, have have to fight against um, the the myopic view that well, it's just not it's, this research isn't top quality, so therefore we're not going to publish it. That's uh, that is that's that's not going to get us where we need to be. So. These are very, very responsible positions, and I think people like me have have, have got to be forward thinking, and if anything, tilt the table in the opposite direction. It's been tilted for centuries, so um, that's the perspective I hold. Uh, and if I could go back to Dr. Weber's question with perhaps a couple of pragmatic points on the survey question. Uh, Validated surveys are always best. Most of what we see in the DEI space are non-validated surveys, and response rate is an issue. So in general, we at JBGS take the perspective that you need a minimum of a 40% response rate from any population to be able to judge that it's a valid sample. And if you don't have that, you need to go out of your way to gather data on the non-respondents to prove that they're no different than the respondents. So I just wanted to throw that in because there may be authors listening 
uh, on that question of survey work. No, thank you for that. You know, um, Stuart had another uh, comment on here that that a recent comment on a webinar on inclusion was is quote there's no place for favoritism and special privileges and equality, and wanted to know what the faculty think. And and I'll take that a step further. Maybe we'll start with you, Lori. The concept of uh, mentorship versus sponsorship. Um, so you know, favoritism and equality. I think what what Stuart's asking is is going back to Mark's original comments about intention and being intentional on increasing a diversity within research. What are your thoughts on that, Lori, and, and, and maybe touch on the sponsorship versus mentorship? Yeah, this is a tough one with words and definition of words, right? So, you know, if we want equality, that means everyone is treated exactly the same. So, uh, you know, if, you know, you, you might want to put your flower on the six foot high shelf uh, and for everybody, the person in the wheelchair, the five foot tall person and the six foot tall person all get your flower put on the six foot high shelf. That's everybody treating being treated equal. Equity is equality of opportunity. So again, seeing what those barriers are that are stopping some people from um, having the same opportunity. So, I mean, you can pick whatever if you want, be it a, a, an ability, disability, be it a, a race or be it gender, be it whatever. And it's looking um, at those barriers, just like Kanu said, and, and, and getting rid of them. So his looking at equity for those patients was get, improving the transportation and access to care. Um, for other people, it might be uh, getting them a step stool in the OR so they can actually see into the wound when their surgeon is six foot five. Um, for other people, it's um, like for girls getting into orthopedics, it might be giving them mentors and sponsors because they're actually trying to get in a very um, male cultured uh, profession. So it's looking at what each underrepresented group has and trying to equal that playing field so that their opportunity is equal. But you don't know what their opportunities are until you look at what the barriers are, which is why we have all the surveys and everything like that. So I, I think. Um, you know, favoritism, our world is full of favoritism. That's patriarchy. Our world favors men, white men who are rich uh, and tech savvy and heterosexual. That's what our world favors. So our world is full of favoritism right now. So I'm not sure what Stuart be by that word, but um, when we talk about equity, we're trying to reduce that favoritism so that our, our and maybe uh, give some favoritism to some people only to reduce those barriers so that we have a quality of our Does that make sense? That it does. And that's what that's what in, in my simple mind, the concept of mentorship and sponsorship goes around is is trying to provide opportunities for someone that maybe wouldn't have otherwise have that opportunity. Kanu, mm -hmm. what do you think? Yeah, I think uh both those questions by Dr. Proper are very uh interesting and we could probably spend an hour just on those. From my standpoint, um, I think we're all by this point familiar with the concept of implicit bias, whereby um, people have natural inclinations um, they may not even be aware of. Um, and if you've never gone online and taken the implicit association test, I encourage you to do that. Most people who think that they don't have a, ref a racial preference will find that you do. And um, so the first question, you know, where do the lack of studies, including minority groups, performance of research and publishing lie in this spectrum? My suspicion is that these days in 2023, we don't have reviewers and editors that are intentionally um, discriminating and choosing to publish um, one study over the other. But my guess is a lot of reviewers and editors do have unconscious bias, whether it is based on something that's relevant to their practice or a study that they may have done. Um, and I think the only way to um, counteract that is to be specifically aware that for many of us, our tendencies lean in that direction and to, to actively um, try to, to oppose that. Um, you know, obviously we just uh, saw the Supreme Court strike down affirmative action, and that's another big issue that um, we probably don't want to get into. 
but um, in in sociology, um, uh, in in specific studies of race and ethnicity in this country, um, there is the perception now that uh, basically I don't see color um, and kind of race neutral approaches to life perpetuates the discrimination um, and uh, racism and bias that uh, since 2020, all of us have been aware of. Um, I, I do not think that's the right approach. I think we need to recognize our biases and we need to take steps to counteract them. Um, and as it relates to, to um, the issue today, diversity in publishing, I think, I think the same applies. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, Lorraine has a great question here. Are you are are any of y'all aware of programs that exist for trainees or early career folks to help ad address potential pitfalls with regards to um, being successful in publishing or you know that next step is is grant writing and funding for for publishing? Is is anyone aware of of groups out there that that can that have programs to to help with that? Lori, how did you get started? How did you become successful in publishing? Just like me, just keep running against the wall and eventually <laughs> something sticks? Yeah, no, I, I I was a bit of a fluke. So um, I just, I my resident research project turned out really good and I found a really good supervisor who just kept me going and I just kept publishing. I, I think it's a, you know, honestly, it's a really great question and I think that's needed for everybody. And I think these skills need to be taught. I think some of the journals may be doing it. Some of the societies are doing it. So some of your, you know, subspecialty societies will have courses on getting things published and stats and things like that. Um, but when we talk about, I just wanted to add this into what Kenu said, but the, when we talk about the lack of underrepresented groups getting published, like that's the end of the line, right? Like getting published is your holy grail. You know, if you have a hundred papers come to the editors to get published and only two of them are from underrepresented groups, it doesn't matter how much you think about the barriers. The barriers happened way in the past, right? So the barriers happened when they didn't get into, you know, graduate school, they didn't get into medical school, they didn't get, you know, the best residency programs, they didn't get mentored or sponsored to be the best they could be. So the problem is a bit the pipeline, and I'm not sure I always like that word, but you, we need to fix the problem a lot farther back than by the time the, the paper gets on Mark's desk. So we need to really think of the problem on a much more global scale and a, and a much bigger timeline, because if, if we can get more underrepresented groups, and that tends to be the, the papers that we're getting in, right? The racial um, groups getting into orthopedics and the number, numbers going up very slowly, women getting into orthopedics and the numbers going up slowly. Like these things will take some time to percolate. But education on on research and, and um, publishing and things like this webinar are the keys because we need to make sure we we feed the pipeline all the way through. No, I, I agree, Mark. What are your thoughts on that? I, I I do I agree with you, Lori. That that maybe some of the subspecialty societies have uh, mentorship programs or or programs for younger members to learn from. Um, Mark, what are your suggestions for young researchers or, or potential researchers that that want to get um, be better at their craft or perhaps want to become a deputy editor? What would your suggestions be to those folks? Uh, well, local mentors are the best source. Uh, if you can establish a relationship with a successful investigator in your field or a related field, doesn't have to be orthopedic surgery, it could be PM and R, could be anesthesia, could be a, a number of different subspecialties that are related to our field. Uh, and the the question is, well, how do you establish that relationship? Well, you first of all, you you have to ask for a meeting. Uh, and then at that meeting, you've got to express what your career goals are. Uh, and then you you've got to make an attempt to connect with that individual and if you're given a task to do or given an opportunity, don't screw it up. Uh, do it ahead of time. Do it well. And then opportunities follow opportunities. Uh, so local is always best. There are organizations like um, Orthopedic Research Society and the subspecialty societies, almost all of them, sports, trauma, 
have uh, mentoring uh, programs where you can apply to be mentored by an individual who's successful. And the same thing applies. You, you better follow through because you're only going to get one chance. Uh, and don't look for excuses. Just get it done. And my last uh, tip is you have to have a high tolerance for frustration. I have uh, often said to many, many groups that people who do uh, research like the people on this panel, including yourself, these are not the normal people. Uh, and the fact of the matter is orthopedic surgery is a great specialty and it's way more rewarding and, and immediately rewarding to take good care of a patient in a clinic setting or do a successful procedure than it is to try to write a grant, usually fail two or three times, ultimately get it funded, and then wait seven years for the answer. That is not a normal person. Uh, and I understand that I'm not normal. And I don't try to make other people like me because I understand it isn't normal. Uh, and I, I try not to look down on people who choose who don't choose that pathway because the world needs great practitioners first and foremost. It also needs people to provide better information on which to make practice decisions. So it does need the weird ones like us. But don't try to make yourself a researcher if you don't have that inclination. And I do think, last comment, that people are born this way uh, with this per personality defect. They're not, you don't make somebody a researcher. Those are, those are great points, and I appreciate your wisdom from years years working on in the subject. So I think I think with that, we'll, I'd like to give people the rest of their time back. This was a fantastic uh, meeting and, and some great questions answered. Thank you very much to our presenters for putting together topics. Uh, I apologize for being a late fill-in. This was Simon Fleming's brainchild, and uh, unfortunately, he's in the operating room and, and, and couldn't uh, join us tonight, but full credit goes to Simon for actually recruiting the, our speakers and putting everything together. For those that are watching, if you missed a part of it, we are going to, this has been recorded and we'll have it on our IOTA YouTube channel and on the, uh, on our website uh, in the coming days. So thank you very much uh, to everyone. Thank you to our presenters, and, and I hope everyone has a good rest of their afternoon, evening, or morning. Cheers. Thanks, everybody.